Thank you, Pastor Joel. I had a chance to visit with Mimi Kaligian this past week, and uh, she's doing much better. She was taken to the hospital. She's in transitional care. The doctors are uh, encouraging or limiting the visits that she has just to her immediate family members uh, in the near vicinity, but hopefully she'll be back home soon as she gets um, her levels all taken care of. But I can't, I mentioned since I can't tell you how much of a joy it was just to see her face after so many weeks. And, and she sends her greetings and really wants me to extend her appreciation for your prayers for her. And we have many others, of course, who are going through difficult times physically. I want to challenge you a little bit from this passage before we go into our business meeting. If you are like me, you tend to resist change. I don't like change. I, there are a lot of things about my life and the way I've run my life that if they would just stay the same forever, I would probably be perfectly content with that. But uh, God brings us into stages in our life where we can't help but deal with changes that are happening and we have to adjust to what's going on around us. And uh, there are certain parts of our lives we very much hold back from when we have to make some kind of a change. I read a story this past week about the, uh, the very famous car engineer, Henry Ford, who was really years ahead of his time, one of the most amazing minds in uh, automobile engineering in those early years. And of course, he designed the Model T and uh, was very proud of that. Uh, he had a man working for him in his engineering department named uh, William Knudsen. And Knudsen was overseeing the production of Ford's Model T and had very much had a hands-on approach to what was going on and uh, was really instrumental behind the scenes in helping this car become the most popular car of their day. Uh, by then, he had uh, seen overseen the production of this car for four years, and Knudsen felt like it was time for him to, and time for them as a company, to consider some changes that should be made to their model uh, to upgrade it, and to really, to be honest with you, to compete with other companies that were producing their own forms of vehicles. He felt for, for a business cause, he should uh, encourage uh, Henry Ford to consider some changes to keep up with the competition around him. Here was the problem. Henry Ford designed the Model T, and it was his baby. And he didn't want anything to do with changing what he had put together. He felt it was the perfect model. Everything about it was right. And so he kept saying, well, maybe later. And he kept putting it off. And Knudsen was uh, imploring him to consider that they're, they're going to reach a point ultimately where they're going to have to make these changes. And he kept resisting. And then he went on a vacation and he was gone for a few weeks. And Knudsen took it upon himself to rush together a prototype of a new vehicle. Just thought, well, if he could see, if he could envision it and see it in his garage, then he might be more open to the idea of changes that they could make. And so he, he designed a new vehicle. And uh, among other things, they, uh, put some new features on it. They did something that uh, Henry Ford never did before. They came out with a new bold color, red. Unthinkable, a bright red color. And uh, some other features they added to it, design, ch design changes. And, and uh, all the time it was in production, this prototype, Henry Ford was not told a thing about it. He comes back from his vacation. He goes to his garage in Highland Park, Michigan, and he was first introduced to this great surprise. Knudsen brought him in the garage and showed him this new prototype with all the changes. And uh, it, there were witnesses that reported what happened at that point. Henry Ford put his hands in his pocket and he circled the car without saying a word five or six times, just looking at it, looking at all the changes on it. When he got over to the driver's side of the car, he opened the door. This new car had four doors, not two. It had a top that could be lowered. It was painted a bright color, and uh, he just kind of was taking it all in, and he got to the side of the car where the driver's side was, and he opened the door, and he forced it against its hinges and broke the hinges and literally ripped the door off. And his staff just stared at him in disbelief. He got into the driver's seat, and he turned sideways, and he reached over, and he kicked the other door open, breaking the latch. He busted the windshield. He climbed to the back seat. And he kicked, literally kicked through the new canvas uh, roof. It was, a, it was a lower roof than his model. And he pretty much destroyed the prototype, much to the surprise of everybody around him. I think that was his way of saying, I don't like it. 
And he didn't like it for one reason only. He didn't like it because he had not designed it and it required him to change his thinking about his, his Model T. Well, Knudsen, as you might imagine, was a little put, put off from this and decided soon thereafter to go work for another company where his creative talents could be put to use. And he did very well in this fledgling company called General Motors. Some of you may have heard of General Motors. And, and Knudsen would have a long and illustrious career working for General Motors. But uh, Henry Ford never, never changed his thinking. As years went by, he finally realized he had to keep up with the times and he had to make some changes. And, and that's when they came out with the Model A. But I want to say this, his heart was never in it. If he had his way, he would have left it just the way he designed it and there would be never been any changes. And if those of you who drive Fords today might still be driving around in something with a canvas top and uh, well, I doubt that, but he, he couldn't bring himself to accept these changes. And he's not unlike many of us today. And uh, for churches, it's hard to accept change. And it's hard to accept change uh, for pastors and deacon boards. You know, I've been here pastoring here for over 30 years. And some of the things we're doing now, we, we implemented those changes when I first came as pastor back in 1990. And it's kind of hard to break away from that kind of thinking sometimes and to realize that even when something could be good or when something deserves a new look, we're just sort of resistant to do that many times. And we as church members get caught into that same rut. And sadly, it affects the way we live our lives, the way we do our, the way we practice our faith and uh, operate within a family context, a Christian family context. Well, this was not unlike what happened here in our text passage. This is a kind of an obscure passage, but I don't know if I can put my finger in the book of Acts on a passage and point my finger down at it and say that there was not a more important decision that was ever reached in the book of Acts than the one we find here in this passage of Scripture. This was huge for God's people in those days of the early church. One might argue that this change referenced here in this chapter may well have been one of the most important changes that took place in the entire first century of Christian history. Critical things were going on. When the Lord spoke to Peter in verse number 13, Peter, recognizing the Lord was speaking to him, and obviously with a sense of respect and, and honor to God, still had the audacity to say, well, not so, Lord. I don't know if this is really what we should do. <laughs> if that doesn't point out the difficulties we have with some of the changes we make in our lives, this is God speaking to him directly in a dream saying, this is what I want you to do. And he said, oh, no, I can't do that. You know, I can't possibly do that. That, that's, that reluctance to do something that we're not uncomfortable with. To this point in history, the church had been around for five or six years. Now, the, the, the message of salvation was primarily geared to the Jews. There were some exceptions to that in the Bible, but I will say this. Those exceptions occurred among Gentiles who converted to Judaism. They were still saved. They accepted Jesus as their Messiah. The, the, the focal point of their worship changed from the Sabbath to the Lord's Day. That transition took place in the book of Acts, and God's people have never varied from that because there were some dear friends of ours running around today who have, uh, would seem to indicate that we have forsaken the Christian Sabbath. No, the Sabbath was for the Jews. The Lord's Day is for God's people. That's why we worship on Sunday. And that transition had taken place in the early church. All of the activity around their worship centered on Sundays. And these Jewish believers accommodated their understanding that Jesus rose from the dead on, on Sunday and they were worshiping on Sunday. They had also taken a bold step, by the way, in putting aside some of the uh, uh, human-made traditions that the Jews practiced. They were able to look at that in the context of Scripture and said, there's nothing about that in the Bible, so we're no longer going to do this or engage in this kind of activity because now we're new people in Jesus Christ. We're saved. God's Spirit indwells us. We have claimed Jesus as our Messiah. We worship Him. We worship on the Lord's Day. We don't need to do all that other junk. But they were still adhering to many of the Jewish observances and holy days as part of their schedule. Most of these Christians would consider themselves good Jews. Just because they were Christians, they were still Jewish. If you went to them and said, are you a good Jew? They would say, absolutely. 
And as a result of that, they had a general disdain for Gentiles. They felt they were God's special called people, and they didn't re- relate well with people who were non-Jewish. In fact, many of the Jewish believers, even Christians of the day, referred to Gentiles as Gentile dogs. Now, I sometimes refer to the young boys in our church and school ministry as handsome dogs, but I, I mean it in the most affectionate way possible. It's not in, in any way meant to be any kind of a criticism. But when a Jew said, you dog, or you Gentile dog, it was not a compliment. And they justified that attitude and approach towards Gentiles. They were not of the faith. They were not God's people. We don't have anything to do with them. Now something was being introduced in this passage of Scripture that they would have never have imagined, namely that God was welcoming the Gentile into his fold and embracing them as his children and allowing them to hear the message of the gospel and be saved themselves. While the Gentiles, how could that be? They were inferior to the Jews. A Jew, a good Jew, would not sit down and eat a meal with a Gentile. A good Jew would never invite a Gentile to spend the night at their house. A good Jew reluctantly did business with the Gentile, but according to the norms and standards of their day, if a Jew bought a, 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 some material or an object or something that was being sold by a Gentile, they took it home and they washed it, ceremoniously cleansed that item before they put it into use. If the Jews did business with Gentiles, the, the coin money that they would use to do business, they would take it home and they would wash the coins that they took for change in, when they exchanged business before putting them back into use. I mean, this was very common practice. Can you imagine that type of arrogance among people who called themselves Christians? But that's the way it was. Gentiles were looked down upon in a major way. Jews would only accept Gentiles under one condition. You know what that is. They had to convert to Judaism. Well, okay, I, we can allow this or that or have you a part of our lives, but you're going to have to convert to Judaism, which included the Jewish rite and, uh, of circumcision for the males. I mean, there was, there was a definite line being drawn in this culture. God was now preparing Peter to understand that his plan was far bigger than Peter would have ever imagined. And among other things, Peter would have to change his thinking and his attitude toward the Gentiles. A very, very difficult thing for him to do. God was welcoming the Gentiles into the kingdom and uh, do so in a very surprising way. And he was making it very clear to Peter that these Gentile believers would not have to convert to Judaism first. They could be themselves. They were welcome to embrace salvation. And he brought together these two very unlikely people to make all this happen. Peter, who was a respected Jew and leader in the early church of Jerusalem, very deeply respected Jew and and, uh, uh, a man of understanding and learning and a a very spiritually minded man, combined with this man called Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. Not only was he a Gentile, he was a Roman. Not only was he a Roman, he was a Roman centurion. So put this in your mindset. Peter was commanded to meet with a man who was in charge of overseeing soldiers who oppressed his people. The Jews despised the Roman government and their role in their their daily lives. And they were living, living in freedom, but living under submission to the Roman government. And their soldiers were there to remind them that we are in control. So the Roman soldiers and leaders among the Roman soldiers were very much looked down upon. And God says to Peter, I want you to go to the house of Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion, and I want you to meet with him. And God gave him a vision. Now, although Cornelius was a Gentile and a Roman soldier, there were some things about his life that are worth noting. If you go back to verse number two of of the 10th chapter of Acts, It gives this added information, which explains why God chose Cornelius to be the recipient of this tremendous bond and relationship that would develop between Peter and Cornelius, between the Jew and the Gentile. It says in verse 2 that Cornelius was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So though he was not yet saved, 
He was on his path to finding God. He was a religious man. He honored God. He feared God. He tried to do good things. He, although he was a Roman centurion, he was not ruthless and prideful and didn't disdain the Jew. He tried to be a good person. And God used him to be the impetus to put together this meeting between Peter and the Gentile world to receive the message of salvation. In fact, when Cornelius was instructed in his own dream that Peter would come and meet with them, he said, this is exciting. This is great. This is not going to be a secret meeting. I want all of my family members and friends to come and join me. God is working here. God is stirring something up. God is preparing us for a great change. And he wanted everybody he could to be there. I didn't read this part of the passage, but look back in verse 24 and let's see what happened here. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them, for Peter and his entourage, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. A Roman centurion falling before a Jewish person. And Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am just a man. Don't, Don't do that. And as he talked with him, he went and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Peter's now addressing Cornelius and his household, you know how that it is unlawful that for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. And I asked therefore what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are in remembrance in the sight of God. Cornelius recounted his vision. Peter did what he was sent to do. He preached the gospel to a Gentile congregation for the very first time. And from that moment on, the world has never been the same. I was telling my wife about this passage of scripture. We were discussing it yesterday. And I said to her, to her, do you realize that that meeting between those two men and Cornelius' extended family and friends, that meeting changed the world. I said, we would probably not be here driving together in this car had it not been for that meeting. Now, we know in God's providence, he could have opened up another venue. I'm not discounting that, of course. I'm not trying to sensationalize this. You know, God could have brought somebody else and he could have given the message of salvation to the Gentile through any different number of means. But because this is the method and the mode that God chose to bring salvation to all the world, and my wife and I uh, attended churches, in her case, a Christian home, and we went to our, 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 our Bible preaching churches. We went off to Bible college together. We met in Bible college We got married, we had our own family, and we're here serving the Lord in this church. All of these things in my life, these important steps of my life, go back historically to this meeting between Peter and Cornelius. Can I say this? But for that meeting, none of you would be here. Not a single Gentile in this congregation would have any hope of eternal life had God not opened his plan of salvation. And I, I just, again press upon you how difficult it must have been for Peter when he was first exposed with the thought that I want you to go preach to the Gentiles, preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Again, a man surrendered to God and serving God, a preacher of the gospel said, oh no, we, I can't do that. He, he had to get rid of his preconceived ideas and accept God's plan and calling for his life. And it involved change. And sometimes folks, change is hard for us. I would like to say, based upon Peter's obedience to God and his, um, you know, uh, approval of everything that took place in that meeting, I would like to say that the Gentiles were quickly embraced into the Jewish church and received as brothers and sisters in Christ. It would take some time. You would imagine that. It took some time for the people to warm up to the idea that, yes, indeed, God was at work. In fact, there was a whole council that took place in chapter number 13 were of all people, Paul, who was a, you know, Jew of the Jews. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Paul was ingrained and brought up and schooled 
in this mentality that the salvation is of the Jews and the Jews only. And everybody on the Gentile world is, is excluded from this wonderful privilege to, be, to have a personal relationship with God. It was Paul who intervened in that council in chapter number 13 and said, God has addressed this issue. God has made it clear to all of us that the gospel is now open to all the world. And Paul really became a, a preacher, preacher of the gospel to the Gentile world. Peter remained pastoring, as it would, in the church at Jerusalem and focused his efforts in Jerusalem. But Paul would later embrace uh, this new change that God brought about and said, well, if God is opening up salvation to the non-Jewish world, then I better get out there and let them know. And he spent the good part of the rest of his life going on missionary journeys, three of them to be exact, bringing the gospel around Asia Minor in Europe. Well, I'm excited that Peter was enthusiastic about this. Cornelius and his family, of course, got saved. And uh, beginning in the next chapter, he discusses what happens with the church at Jerusalem, goes back and tells them what God had given him in a dream, what had happened with his meeting with Cornelius and his family, how God had poured out his spirit upon Cornelius' household and how they had gotten saved. And God has opened up a new dispensation of grace for everyone who would come. And their response, this church, like a church like ours, in Jerusalem, their response is recorded for us in chapter 11, verse number 18. And here's what it says. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Isn't that exciting? You could have said, right, we're having none of this. I hate, I despise those Gentile dogs. You're making all this up, Peter. They said, no, if God is in this, if this is what God wants us to do, then we're all, we're all in on this. May the Lord be blessed and may people come to know Christ, whether they're Jew or Gentile. Paul would later say, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. To the Jew first, yes, but also to the Greek or Gentile. And also for any of us today. Sometimes God has to change our thinking before he can change how we operate and serve him in our lives. He's got to change our thinking. And, and I would imagine if you're like me, uh, we probably all have some preconceived ideas about the way that things go and the way that things, we, the way things should be. And sometimes God has to say, well, wait a minute. I may have a different pl plan for you, a different way for you. I may, I may uh, muddy the waters here a little bit for you. I may disrupt your plans. I may uh, take your timetable and completely flip it out of, out of whack. And the question for us today is, are we willing to adapt to the changes that God brings into our lives, these disruptions, these detours, these difficulties? How do we respond to those when they come into our lives? Because if I have, if, if, if my, if I have my finger on the heartbeat of our church, God is no doubt stirring the waters right now. He's brought some people through some difficult times, some things we, didn't, we would have never expected to have happen in our lives. And he's preparing us for change. And if God is in it, it's always good. The end result is always good. Listen to this. Maybe write the reference down. This is when Pastor Joel uh, taught in Sunday school today. He was admonishing us to meditate upon Scripture, and he alluded to the fact that memorizing Scripture can be very beneficial. This would be a good one to commit to memory. If you write down the reference, Jeremiah chapter 29, and I'll read verses 11 through 13. God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In other words, I have an end result in line. You may not know it, but when I think of you and I bring circumstance into your life, I have an ultimate goal I have in view, and you may not understand it at the time, but it's going to be a good thing. Trust me, you're going to like it when you get there. Then shall you call upon me, he says, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Is God putting you in a place of change today? Then call upon him. Search him, search him out. Ask him what he's doing in your life and what this expected end is and trust him to embrace those changes that he takes us through. And in doing so, he will be glorified and I promise you this, you will be a better person by embracing your changes.